This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Kind of you. Thank you. Robin, like many of you know Robin, uh, she's fantastic and, had, and has been a, just a tremendous uh, help to me in learning how to be a, a good teacher over, over my entire time here at, at Stanford. So thank you for spending lunchtime uh, with me. Um, I, uh, I thought I was going to be seeing my therapist right now because uh, having um, looked at who I'm com following this year, I, I, I don't know if you had a chance to see uh, uh, the uh, Chris Edwards or Ron Barr uh, or any of the other speakers, it, it is incredibly humbling to, to get up here and talk about this out and follow them. I feel sort of like John Denver following Tina Turner or somebody like that. I mean, you know, wow, I, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, that's a that's sort of a dated example, perhaps, for many of you, <laughs> but so be it. And actually, I'll, I'll try to turn that into what uh, we're, we're after today. So let's just get rolling. I mean, enough of this imposter syndrome stuff, but thanks for bringing it back to me in dr just, you know, waves over the last weekend as, um, and over the last month as I got ready for this. Uh, you know, I do teach a river subject, uh, for those of you who had a chance to see Professor Barr. You remember that wonderful metaphor that he had about uh, interdisciplinary topics? So I mean, I'm squarely in one of those. I'm a professor of engineering. My office is just right across the uh, walkway here in, in Terman Engineering. I see some other professors of engineering here, like Eric Roberts, who's been so good to me, too, uh, since I've been here for the last 12 years. So that's where I am. You're going to hear a little bit about that for context only. It's not just about me today. I'm going to tell you about technology. Um, and guess what? You get two for one today. Uh, because as we were joking about in the hallway of, uh, of my uh, office, near my office, it's, it's not just Tom and this crazy picture of me, but it's Forrest Glick. Here's Forrest Glick over here. I, you can call me Batman, and this is Robin, or better, <laughs> you can call him Batman, and I'll be Robin. It's really a lot more equal than that. Uh, Forrest is the Director of Educational Technology at the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. Did I get that right? That's right. And he is my sidekick, and it's going to be pretty clear how... Uh, that plays out. He worked at Harvard in uh, media technology before we were lucky enough to get him to come and join our center and program. And I think it'll be clear why I have him here today, uh, mostly because he's, he's even more interesting than maybe I am, but there's a real value there. And we're going to try to achieve a few things with you. One thing we're going to do is we're not going to use PowerPoint. <laughs> we're not going to give death by PowerPoint. <laughs> Wow, good crowd. We're not going to use PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, it, okay, thank, and, and it's no, no slight to our good friends at Microsoft. I mean, it, 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 maybe Google will make PowerPoint someday. It'd be the same thing. It's not a slight. It's just PowerPoint. PowerPoint's very, very uh, important. Uh, it has been really wild. Not only having imposter syndrome the last uh, week, I found how hard it was to let go of that. I, you know, last weekend I said, I'm not going to use PowerPoint. You know, and I, because I sort of had an outline for what I wanted to do today, and then it hit me last weekend. I said, I'm not going to use it. And, and it was, and having watched, uh, you know, Chris Ed Edwards use the uh, term in his last time he was in here, he said, uh, it's a crutch. And it, it is a crutch. Try it. Try your next lecture without PowerPoint and see what happens. Try, now try to use some other technologies. And believe me, Murphy's Law, or Murphy is in the room. I, is anybody named Murphy? <laughs> Because you're in the room, we know. Because we're going to try a lot of other technologies. You didn't escape that. But we're not going to use that particular one um, to, as a crutch or, or as an aid. Although, that's, that's, you know, it's, a, it's a good tool, obviously. Um, let, so let me dive in. Let me dive into the objectives today. Sort of a, you know, tell you what we're going to tell you. And then uh, I'll try to rush through this. And then you know, we're going to do it. And then when, uh, we'll wrap up. I'll do like everybody else. We'll try to get this done in a half an hour or you know, quarter to one so we can have lots of uh, Q&A. Uh, but it's a brave new world out there. You hear that term sometimes when you're talking about Silicon Valley versus faster, better, cheaper. It is a brave new world when it comes to educational technologies. And I see a lot of heads nodding. And I'm just an entrepreneurship teacher in the School of Engineering trying to make my way. So this is my story today with Forrest giving me a hand. That's really what today is all about. And I think you, from watching some of the old videos, that's what you prefer. And, and because I certainly, oh my gosh, there, there are all, all kinds of key success factors. And I see faces in the room that I've learned from, like I've already mentioned Eric, 
when I came back from industry and started teaching 12 years ago, I've always been a student of great teaching and all kinds of you know, important things to do in the classroom, role playing, and, and I use the case method, so I learned a lot of that from our friends in the uh, business school here at Stanford and, and other friends at Harvard Business School who uses the case method or the law school. So there's all those kinds of things. So I'm not gonna do that today. I was thinking, how can I add to that? Because especially uh, given this series, it has so many uh, wonderful speakers before me. So I said, why don't we just try What's, what's, what, what, what's on my mind lately, and has been now for several years, um, most when it comes to teaching, or one of the most thing, things on my mind, and, and it has been this, how do I take advantage and leverage and stay current with, te uh, with uh, technology? So let me just uh, let me tell you, show, share with you a, a, a set of quotes from, a, from an old friend who used to run Computer World magazine and is now just a blogger out there in the blogosphere. And he... Uh, this is his take on the 21st century 20-something, or you know, in other words, our students, whether they're 20 years old, 25 years, 30 years old, even you know, older. But let's, let's zero in on undergrads, because that's what I've been teaching mostly the last few years. Quote, over the past, this is like a typical student, perhaps, I, I would say. Quote, over the past year, I've almost completely disconnected myself from traditional media. I left my newspaper subscription lapse 18 months ago. What little television I watch is piped through TiVo sans commercials. My email filter catches and discards all but the wiliest marketing or other messages. I can't remember the last time I listened to a car radio. Uh, all of my drive time audio is podcast. Direct mail goes into the trash unopened. Uh, I'm on the internet, I rarely surf, I mainly search. The few websites that I authorize to contact me uninvited do so through an RSS feed. I don't have kids, but I got a couple of nephews in college, one at Duke as a senior and, and one is a sophomore at UC uh, Boulder. And I've grown up, they grew up around here and I'm very, very close to them. And watching them unfold as well as the students that we teach, you know something? And I'm talking to those of you who are over 40 with me and even over 50 with me. You know something? Instant messaging and text messaging is more important than email. I know that's hard to believe. Instant messaging and text messaging. They would rather give up email than text messaging and instant messaging. They'd rather give up, I wish I, was, I should have been doing show and tell, their PC or laptop than what? Cell phones. Cell phones are a new platform. I mean, and so this is just wild. So for those of us who think we're hip by using email and the internet and a laptop and PowerPoint, it's like the Macarena. You remember the Macarena where we think we're... You remember that thing? How stupid they I mean, they, they don't know that. We know actually people who can. Did you ever do the Macarena? Come on, those trips to Mexico. So, so you know that's kind of the you know the situation we're in. So I am really, uh, just like I'm really afraid of becoming stale uh, about what's going on through the minds of technology entrepreneurs, and that's why I serve on boards. Um, I want to stay connected to the the mindset. I'm really afraid of getting stale in the classroom especially with this wave, this brave new world of technology. So we're going to show you kind of a behind the scenes look at uh, you know, our, my world today. Um, so you're going to hear that it takes significant time, no shortcuts, I'm sorry, it's going to take more time. I don't know about you, but I actually measured it the other day. I had a, uh, I'm teaching on Tuesday, Thursday afternoons. Uh, it's a large undergraduate class. You're going to see the website a good bit for it here as I just show you know, a day in my life. So uh, Monday, you know, Sunday afternoon, Monday and Tuesday, I was prepping for a two-hour uh, class Tuesday afternoon, right? So I teach Tuesday afternoon, three to five. So on Sunday and on the holiday, I was prepping. I actually kept a, a log. Uh, in the old adage of, you know, one hour of class, how many hours do you prep? Three, yeah. Actually, it was four this time. So I had eight hours of prep for a two-hour class, and a lot of it had to do with these videos. So I got bad news for you. It's really, really cool stuff, uh, this technology, but it actually increases the time, so no shortcuts. And then um, you need somebody like Forrest. <laughs> and so you're going to get to know him, and you, but you can't hire him. You're going to have to go hire your own media specialist and, and uh, so on. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's get at it. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we do, Forrest. Um, do you want to start we, with eWeek? Yeah, let's, let's start with, so for example, just to make it real, this is something that we're putting on over the next week. You see it in front of you. It's not meant to be an advertisement, but uh, an advertisement. I just want to 
sort of show you what we do beyond teaching. Um, have you heard about this? So now it kind of looks like I'm just going to assume. Okay, so this is a set of activities starting Saturday, running for a whole week. The opening ceremony is on Saturday over at Hewlett. You're all welcome. Bring a friend, uh, so on. And we're going to celebrate the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation here at Stanford. We're just one group behind it. Uh, all the groups on campus associated with entrepreneurship and innovation are, are, have come together to put on a, on a super week. And as a matter of fact, um, besides the kickoff, I, I had the pleasure of uh, welcoming you and, and inviting you to an incredible panel next Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, it happens to be the source, this, this seminar series, which we're combining with eWeek, happens to be the source of the videos that you're going to see today and, and what we leverage. So there's a real uh, connection there. But not, notwithstanding that, what we're going to do in that panel is connect, and it's, I'm sorry for the digression here, but we're going to connect uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking, innovation, and that sort of thing to the three big challenges facing the world this century. No big deal, just the three big challenges. They happen to be the big challenges that Stanford and Hennessy and, and the leadership here at this wonderful university have said uh, we're going to put our, our horses behind, and that is human health. That's environment, and that's the global and international issues. So you're all welcome. I've pulled together uh, quite a, uh, go on down real quick, quite a, a lineup of, of people in each one of those areas, including professors and entrepreneurs. So come on over Wednesday at 4. But I think the important point is that entrepreneurship just doesn't happen in a classroom. These are real-world examples that are brought in that are actually bringing it to life so the students can see you know, examples of people who are out there doing it. Yeah, thanks, Forrest. And it's his team will be there filming, so you can actually... Now that you can watch us today, you'll get an idea, uh, or you'll get to know us today, you'll actually see how we're, we're uh, operating. So anyway, let's go back to the uh, SCVP site. Thanks for reminding me on that. So this is where, this is where we hang out, and we, do, uh, we build curriculum. We're in the Management Science and Engineering Department, so we're, we don't do give degrees. We're just a center, like the D, uh, D School, D Institute, or, or you know, the other programs and institutes and centers and so forth, all the different names on campus that cut across and help uh, departments and schools be successful. So we don't give degrees, but we do build courses all under the MSNE uh, department. Uh, we do uh, basic research, and the PhDs tend to be, come out of our department in MSNE, but we serve, oh my God, students from all the different schools on campus. I, in particular, get excited to and reach out and teach uh, engineering students from all the different departments, as well as humanities students, as well as scientists. So it's a, it's more, we do a lot of service component. And then we, we uh, developed a couple of, uh, outreach is a funny word, but you know, uh, dissemination uh, or pipes, if you will. And one of them is a set of conferences, which is another story. But today, what we're going to talk about is something called Educator's Corner, because I'm gonna, it, is a set, it is a website with a whole bunch of video clips that I want for us to introduce to you. And then I'm going to show you how I use it. Sure. Thank you, Tom. So uh, thank you again, everyone. I'm the director of technology for the group. Um, about five years ago, uh, the Kauffman Foundation out of Kansas City, which is a, um, a center uh, fostering entrepreneurship, came to us. And we had been uh, capturing, along with uh, Stanford Center for Professional Development, a series of entrepreneurial thought leaders who would come to campus each week and speak to uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Um, we had been capturing that on videotape and kind of putting it on the shelf. And they came to us and said, if we give you some grant money, will you figure out a way to disseminate these to a larger audience? So out of that grew Educator's Corner. This is actually version 4.5, so we've had a number of iterations over the years. This is our current version. I'm just going to give you a kind of a, a quick, uh, very very brief overview of what the, what the project is and uh, how you can possibly make use of it. Uh, we have over 1,200 resources available on the site, around 900 of which are videos. So that's kind of our mainstay. Uh, these sessions are captured each week uh, as part of the lecture series, edited into clips with the idea that they can actually be used for teaching in the classroom. Tom will kind of give an example of that, but let me quickly kind of give you a, a view of the site. Um, we built this entire website from the ground up. It has a database on the back end, and it's actually pretty mature and robust in terms of the way that we interact with it. We hire students who help edit the content, write the descriptions, kind of build out the material. Uh, for the more than 1,200 resources on the site. Um, an example, and, and again, Tom will kind of draw some of these in uh, later on. Here's a video. We now compress the video for Flash, so kind of using current web standards similar to YouTube, which also uses Flash. The video plays right on the site. It used to be that you had to click and then wait for a real player or something to launch. Now it happens right in the site. 
We also make the uh, video clips available for download as an MPEG and a Windows media file so that faculty can actually embed that right into their PowerPoint presentation. If you're going into a room that you haven't given a talk in before, you don't want to have to rely on an internet connection. You actually want to have that video file available to you. So that's available to registered users. It's free to register. We have a uh, little over 11,000 registered users for the site. About 40% of our traffic comes from an international audience. So we actually have a growing international interest in these videos. And we're happy to leverage that, being that um, you know, it's really just the web server doing the work. One other piece um, that I'll touch on before handing it back to Tom is our recent success with podcasts. We have been doing the videos for years. Uh, a little over a year ago, we started to think about podcasting. What would it be to allow actually a download of the audio file? And this has just been taking off, uh, and we've been really happy with the success. Each of the lectures is available in its entirety. You can see it goes back a, a number of quarters. Tom mentioned the e-week session, so you can see that listed here as the upcoming podcast for next week. We actually capture the audio as an MP3 file, process it the same night, post it to the site. We've had 900,000 downloads of these podcasts um, over the last uh, 15 or so months. Um, so we get a lot of people actually finding out about SDVP, finding out about what's going on at Stanford through this site. We're and it's, all, it's put through the Stanford site as well, right? Right. It's, it's also available on the Stanford iTunes site. We publish directly to the uh, Stanford kind of public um, site. You can see us listed here, Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders. I think we're currently number five on iTunes um, due, to the, the logo right here. due to the volume that we get. So this is the Apple site. And I think one of the differences that, that people have enjoyed about this and something that I think about as a director of technology is this is actually a push model. So people subscribe to this and they actually get it every week. They don't actually have to come through the front door of our website. So that's been a really interesting lesson for us. The files are portable for people and I think they really appreciate that. They don't have to go to their computer and watch a little video. They actually have the audio where really most of the content is available. So one quick takeaway is that for, for those of us on the faculty, the educators, there are, there's a growing number of forests around campus. You know, media technologists who understand this stuff and are here to support us. I yep. threw a curve at you, so I'm going to back up a little bit and sure. say, okay, so we, we have discovered some value, and I'm going to show you at least how I'm attempting to do that, uh, out of video clips, you know, delivered uh, out of audio clips or, you know, podcasts. So I want to ask you, what other technologies have come on since the Macarena? <laughs> what other technologies have come on stream, uh, or even in the last 15 years, uh, that um, help, help us do a better job, maybe, maybe help us have more impact with our students? What are some others? Course, well, yeah, course management. Websites. So, you, and there's even branded ones like WebCT and uh, what is it, Blackboard? What else? Other tech? Yep. Wikis. 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 So what are wikis? It's where either you as the instructor or the students can post up chunks of information they feel are valuable, valuable, and it's great for collaboration, especially for project spaces if you're working in groups. Yeah, user Everyone generated. Can kind of edit it. Yeah. Content. Just you've been to Wikipedia, right? So there, you can do your own wiki. Okay. What else? Blogs. Blogs. Yep. Or web logs, and there's both uh, in words and videos now. Everybody know what a blog is, I'm assuming. All right. What other ones come to mind? Discussion boards. Yep. Discussion boards. Thank you, Forrest. <laughs> Discussion boards. <clears throat> Listservs. They have all kinds of names. Listservs, Google Groups, that sort of thing. Think, yep. Animations. Animations. Like applets and animations to convey concepts. Yeah. Uh, so, so animation software, you mean? I'm thinking of the software itself. Simulations. Simulations. Yes. Oh, simula and, and simulations. Great, yeah. Yeah, just solve some. Video conferencing. Oh, video and web conferencing, right? Video. And some of that's built into the course management. Video and web conferencing. So I'm just trying to get the universe up here. Did, did I cover everything? <clears throat> I mean, we, let's, just, let's put Internet 2.0, I mean, or Web 2.0, because there's a, 
whole bunch of rich things going on with uh, the, the second generation of the internet. Yeah? Would you consider a student response system? Yeah. Which one oh, comes to mind? Well, I, I actually haven't used the electronic ones. I have a, I have a, a paper one that I'm using to simulate the electronic ones. Right, but so also the like example in, in, in class clickers. In, so they'll put up a quiz. Oh, oh, oh so, yeah, look, what, what do they call those? Personal um, response. Personal response. Personal response. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, good one. Thank you. Yeah. Personal response systems, right. Real And real time, right? Yeah. Real time. All right, uh, good. So, all right, folks, show of hands times. Let's find out, uh, you know, how, you know, that, that thing called the chasm model, that adoption of technologies. So we'll find out what, we, we, let's find out if we've got any geeks in the room. That's what we're after, early adopters. Okay, who's been using, in your teaching, who's been using video clips? Oh, how about it? we got a lot of students in here. Who's either been, if, whether you're a teacher or the student, who has participated in a learning environment where there were video clips involved, whether before the class or during class? Oh, we're across the chasm on that. All right, good, good, good. We're in pretty good shape there. All right, what about audio podcasts? A little less so, okay. All right, we'll just do this, this. All right, less so. All right, how about course management websites where you, you, you use those? Okay, they seem to be pretty popular. Wikis? Who's used a wiki in an educational way? Okay, a little less so. Okay, uh, video and web conferencing. Oh, really? It's not even really light, okay? Um, and then a personal, <laughs> I know one hand's going up. <laughs> personal response in real time. Like it's like survey system. Oh, actually, pretty good. Pretty good. I, I, I'd give it more. All right. Uh, blogs in, in, a, in an educational setting. Okay. Good. Uh, discussion boards, you know, listservs. Uh, Pandora, I think, is one of the ones. Okay. Good. Uh, that, that's actually surprising. It's less than I thought. Uh, animations and simulations software. So, all right. Still the same thing. And then. Uh, the Internet 2.0, I mean, we're sort of all using that, I would say. So, so what's interesting is uh, video clips uh, looks like are, are uh, in, in, uh, much more used than some of the other. But you get, first of all, you see the broad spectrum of, uh, of usage. And, and it's, it's exactly following that technology adoption cycle. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I want to show off a couple, but I want to tell you what goes through our mind as we we think about these technologies. Um, I'm, I'll also qualify by saying we're not going to talk about the delivery and distribution. Um, we're not going to talk about distance learning. I, I'm not an expert in that. Um, and we've got great experts uh, right behind us here in the Stanford Center for Professional Development, you know, the people who deliver and have been doing it since the days of microwave. Um, and we give, you can get a whole master's in electrical engineering via Stanford Online. So that those, those technologies and how that uh, takes place is just, just incredible. And there's a lot of experts and, um, uh, and knowledge about that. And it might even be worthy of a, of a session sometime in a future uh, CTL seminar. So we're going to pass on that. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of my colleagues reminded me of, of a attempt he made. And this is sort of uh, in the video and web conferencing combined with this. He actually tried to teach a class simul simultaneously here at Stanford with students in Sweden and Singapore you know, at the same time of day. And so things like that. So we're not, we're not going to have the chance to, to go too far into that. Nor, or, or we should at least send an you know, acknowledgment to our friends in Wallenberg who are trying out uh, all kinds of techniques in the physical space as well as virtual, but physical space. And so if you haven't had a tour of Wallenberg over the last few years, I urge you to do that. All right? So we're going we're gonna to pass on that. We're going to narrow down the focus. And here's the, sort of the six criteria that Forrest and I and those of us who are playing around with this as more or less users um, and trying to make our, our teaching uh, better, uh, we, come, we come up with these questions as we, as we uh, work on this. One of them is, oh, is this best, is this particular tool that's come on you know, uh, best for classroom use, something like this in real time, or is it, you know, which is a synchronized relationship we're having? We're having a relationship here, by the way. Uh, or outside of the class, you know, not in real time, in async, as they say, in, uh, in, t in media technology world. Um, when do you, second one is when do you use a push model? Uh, you know, watch this video before coming to class. Um, it's sort of related to that versus a pull model, which is you know, students pick the videos for others to watch. And I'll show an example of that. Um, how mature, we already did this, but how mature are the technologies? Where are they in the, uh, you know, the uh, technology uh, adoption scale? Um, in other words, you have to be a geek in order to, to use it. How much pain are you going to put up to get whatever benefit is, is there? You have to be a classic early adopter, or are you going to wait to be, you know, 
across that chasm into the mainstream and wait for things to settle down with where reliability and quality are much, uh, uh, you know, higher. And it, so uh, um, next one is what about the classes, uh, sizes? This is appropriate for things like uh, my little Mayfield Fellows program, which is only 12 students a year, or is it more appropriate for the class I'm teaching this afternoon, which is, you know, 70 some odd, you know, to 100 students, or is it appropriate for uh, something like our big seminar series, which I invited you to next week, which happens to have a course associated with it, which is a couple of hundred students. So, you know, where does it fit on that? Uh, this is related. What, what, what are you going to do about access? This is, this, these are questions that have been haunting all of us trying to go online for a while, but it, they didn't go away. What about access? Are you going to just restrict it to your class? Are you going to restrict it to the stanford.edu domain, a la Facebook? Or are you going to uh, be completely public with it? And that leads to the last question, which is the C word, the copyright, fair domain, you know, use domain, doctrine uh, issues, you know, where you have to, to watch the legal aspects. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, things to ch uh, think about. So let's, let's show you how we went through this process. Um, you've done Educator's Corner, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got a tool. So that's a tool that, say, I want to take advantage of. So let's go to my website of the course I'm teaching this quarter. Here it is, it's just a website. I actually, I'm not using a course management tool. I actually, we built this website from scratch. It's fine, it could have been one of the, you know, the off the shelf ones. Let's go to the calendar, which is a, uh, this is called Engineering 145. It's an introductory class. Uh, I see some students in here from it. Uh, they're, they're students from all over campus, all different majors. And what I'm trying to teach is the fundamentals of entrepreneurship to them. So let's go down below. Let's say we kick off. This is the second session day, January 11th. Let's go to see what was assigned that day. Uh, so we got a quote of the day. We had somebody from uh, Office of Technology Licensing saying hi, uh, because for the term project. Here's a summary, let's go up a little bit. And here's the classic sort of list of, here's the required readings before we uh, point out some study questions. So the first few readings you know, would be typical. Here I uh, had the joy of have done a textbook for this uh, course. So here's my textbook. So read chapters one, one two, and three. We have another book that they read from my uh, friend Randy Komasar, read the first three chapters. So that's, cla that's classic stuff. Go online and maybe read an article from the Harvard Business Review uh, to go purchase that. But if you look at this, watch the following short video clips. There's four of them. Click on Kavita Ramdas. And, and, and th we'd ask them to play it. So let's go and play it. This is before they come to class. Um. I want to um, take a little bit of time in the half an hour that I have been given, and I hope um, we have plenty of time for questions, to talk a little bit about what I understand when I hear the word entrepreneur. Um, I'm a, I have a great fondness for dictionaries so, um, and, and languages in general. So um, I like the fact that at a time when it seems to be a bad thing to say anything about the French, we're actually using a word that has no real translation in English. It's a French word. It is um, uh, from two different words, entre and prendre. Um, to be in, uh, which is entre, and, to, and prendre, which is to take. So it's not just to undertake, it's really to immerse yourself in something that is um, that also takes hold of you. So there is a there is a, a sense of kind of deep immersion into the process that I think anybody who is an entrepreneur just instinctively understands whether or not they speak French. So Kavita is the CEO of the Global Fund for Women. She happens to be one of the panelists next Wednesday, just a little plug. Always a salesman. But that's coincidental. Um, no, it wasn't. Um, so, <laughs> but I wanted you to, to see her because She's going to win the Nobel Prize someday. And, and yes, she lives locally. And yes, I might have gotten her to come by class. But I can have this anytime I want. I could, I could have this um, in Dubai if I happen to be there, which I was three weeks ago. So we'll see that in a minute. So it doesn't always have to be our clips. Let's go to another uh, session, the one I taught Tuesday afternoon. Let's go to another session page. So back to the calendar. Thank you. You're great. You're like Paul Schaefer over here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> like David Letterman. He laughs at everything I say, too. This is great. Um, all right, so uh, February 20th. That was the other day. What they, uh, we had a lawyer uh, there that day um, from Fenwick and West, and we, we were going to do a case, Nano G. But I said, look, I want you to watch some of these things about company culture and so on. And I wanted to draw the analogy of a CEO, uh, job or a founding uh, CEO type of job at a technology company. 
uh, being a conductor. So I, we found something in the New Yorker magazine. Maybe you've seen this. It's very cool. This is not necessarily our stuff. And this is a lot, by the way. We're, we're, this is not is a profession that looks utterly mysterious from the point of view of the audience. So he gets up in front of the orchestra, turns his back to the public, and waves his arms. In fact, a conductor, a good conductor, is communicating constantly with the orchestra and channeling an enormous amount of very intricate information. And it's difficult to decode what exactly a conductor is doing because there's no international language of conducting. There are really only very few gestures that are standard. And beyond that, everything is very so personal. So I could have gone to YouTube or something like that and, and, and grabbed a funny video, but I thought you could see even the serious videos like that. And, I, and of course, that gave me a, a, a huge opportunity in the class to, to draw that analogy between what it's like to conduct an orchestra uh, and be uh, the founding CEO or the leader of a, of a crazy startup. So it's not always about uh, videos beforehand, the async way of using them. Let's see what happens. Here it comes the only PowerPoint of the day. So let's bring up a deck that, uh, huh, I, you know, I lied earlier. I, I didn't tell it. I, the one quick PowerPoint. So here I am, halfway around the world, 12 time zones away, and I'm a little nervous as we'll talk about um, making, about the connection I might have, in, in, in the internet connection, the reliability. So what do I do? I'm, I'm giving a lecture the first day. Let's go on. I want to talk about vision, you know, the mission, the purpose of a particular, you know, of startups and why that's very important. And then I might go on, and then, by the way, that's real dry. Go back. I mean, is that, is that a typical PowerPoint slide or what? I even threw in a little graphic to try to, you know, spit it out. But on come on. Open the slide too, so. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was even doing it twice. That's right. So I only have one picture. That's the only picture I ever use. But anyway, um, you know, get the vision, all that. So there's a graphic image. But what if I could stop right here and say, why do people start companies? What did they start? And then we'd have, you know, you tell me while we start. And then I'd say, well, let's hear from a fellow that helped launch the original Macintosh, has been a, a prolific author of eight books about high tech, uh, is now a venture capitalist. Let's hear from him. Let's click on that. That's all I do is click. And I set this up. You don't have to be techie to do this. The first thing I figured out and learned, sometimes the hard way, about entrepreneurship is that the core, the essence of entrepreneurship is about making meaning. Many, many people start companies to make money, the quick flip, the dot-com phenomena. And I have noticed in both the companies that I've started and funded and been associated with, that those companies that are, are fundamentally founded to change the world, to make the world a better place, to make meaning, are the companies that make a difference. They are the companies to succeed. My naive and romantic belief is that if you make meaning, you will probably make money. But if you set out to make money, you will probably not make meaning and you won't make money. So my first thought is you need to make meaning. That should be the core of why you start a company. There are three ways to make meaning. First is to increase the quality of life. My background is the Macintosh division of Apple Computer. And I can tell you with total certainty that we were not motivated by making money. We were motivated by changing the world to make people more creative and more productive. We were trying to increase the quality of life for the Macintosh user. All right. And that was so I invite you to come to the website and hear the rest of that because it's, it's compelling. So what, do you, what are some of the advantages of what you just saw? Me using Kavita <coughs> to, for them to see beforehand and Guy right then. Why do you think uh, I'm so excited about this? listen to you all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got that figured out. And there's a she said, you don't have to listen to you all the time. I just want to make sure that was picked up. <laughs> That's one. Very good one. It gives you, you know, actually gives me a break to collect my thoughts. You're always looking for those breaks. That's like, yep. What else? Credibility and your, whatever you're presenting. Credibility? You don't have to fly anybody in. <clears throat> right. So, so people around, the, not, not everybody's so blessed, especially in this, you know, first of all, we're, we're just taking our little domain of, of uh, content. There's so many, you know, there's, you know, there's thousand domains of content here at Stanford. Um, but we're, we're particularly lucky in that we have access to these kinds of folks nearby. So the fact, that's why we give these away around the world. They're being used by educators around the world. But even when I'm around, you know, somewhere else, like I said, 12 time zones, I can do that. and still have guided. What else? 
the, the benefit of having it during the class is you can coach them and pick the points that you want them to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Tina Seeley, actually, she, she'll, she'll put up a video, two videos on a page. She'll play one on one side of the issue, you know, an expert, you know, saying, uh, tastes great, and then she'll find another expert saying, less filling. And it's really interesting that she can, on the same subject, she can have two experts saying uh, both sides of the coin, and that just really gets it. She refers to it as a fun. virtual panel, so she literally kind of gets her... You know, picks and chooses. You know, David Nealman and you know somebody else. You know, counterpoint for counterpoint, which the students really enjoy. Yeah, we get a kick about that. On our homepage, one of the highlighted uh, of the four videos is uh, go back to the homepage. You guys, this is just classic this week. Uh, this is David Nealman, the CEO of JetBlue, on creating a customer experience. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I get put my. It's just amazing. I, it just happened. I, I walked in this morning and went, "Oh my God!" There's David on the homepage. All right. Um, all right. So let's. Uh, you know, there's one more, and then I want to show you uh, a couple more things, and then we'll do Q and A. Uh, how about diversity? I mean, did you? Did you and I, I. Yeah, I picked Kavita and Guy, but frankly, our database is is, is full of that, and I'm talking about demographics. And because the classroom is completely different than the typical, you know, when I, go, when I see what, in my field, when I see what our colleagues around the world are, are bringing into the classroom, they, they, uh, no offense, these people look like me, you know, and uh, that's not necessarily the greatest signal in the world. So there's an amazing opportunity uh, to bring uh, a message of that, no, this, the, the, the people, the, the match, the, the, the diversity and the demographics of my classroom to match it with the kinds of role models that we're you know, putting forth. And there's a way to do that via uh, video. All right, so let's, uh, let, let me show you one more thing. Let's go back to the website for my course. Because this is a lot of work, what I just did for you. And I told you the other day, it's increased the amount of prep time and, and before the course and even during the course. So let's go to the Teams page. And this is, we, we have, uh, this is a class of about 75 students. Uh, they're on different teams, so look how cute they are. We make them take a photo at the beginning. They have a team you know, name, cardinal rule, frozen assets. I like that one. Uh, pigs might fly, uh, fully vested, you know, and say preferred stock, rags. Of business. Okay, so they, the best name this quarter, of course, is Buyer's Business Casual because they made fun of my jeans and, ja and jacket. And so here's the, they had to create a website. Uh, for their term project and created it early on and they've been posting their key deliverables all quarter. Just uh, go up a little bit. So this is Buyer's Business Casual, the team in, in my course later today. And here's the different milestones that have been posted. So of course everybody sees this. This is open for everybody else in the rest of the class to see their, your, you know, the project status reports. Now what I want to get to is, and it's too bad because it's next week, next Thursday as we get to the end of the quarter, they have to have gone into the video clips Frankly, most of them will go to the educator's corner to, to, to look for video clips because it's, they're easily searchable. Or maybe they'll go out on YouTube or, or otherwhere, otherwhere, other places, and they're going to propose one or two video clips relevant to their project for the rest of us to watch before they do their presentations the following week. So that is truly getting the students to watch, and they have to watch a lot of video clips, learn a lot along the way, and then pick one or two they think are, are super and, and that the rest of us ought to see. So this website, like all the other websites, will have those video clips posted, and, and it will be required for the rest of us to have a look. So there's a, you know, there's, there's a getting the students to, you know, to, that's what I call the pull model as, as opposed to you know, me pushing. And last but not least, it's, it's, so, it, it's, it's something that I fought. When we were doing the second edition of this textbook, it's called Technology Ventures, um, my co-author who's up at UC Davis and um, McGraw-Hill, said, no, no, wow, wow, cool videos. Uh, will you get permission? And let's put them uh, in the book. Let's do a DVD that's just uh, stuck in the back. And I thought they were, you know, I argued, oh, gosh, that kind of seems cheesy and, uh, and promotional. But it, in fact, I, I, pr I probably was wrong. I mean, and I'm, I'm learning I was wrong. It's actually a, a cool experiment. What it is is like, uh, say, the student's reading uh, section 1.4. And there's a little icon saying, see the DVD. You don't have to have an internet connection. We, we almost are there, you know. But 
As I've learned when I was uh, teaching in London last year, I'm not just dropping names, I'm just trying to tell you physical locations. Here I was in London, you know, a capital of the world, at the London Business School. Firewall issues killed me. They just killed me. I, I'm so glad I had that little puppy. It's just about 30 videos on here that I had along with me so I could slip in and go, you know. It just killed me because I had forgotten to download it and bring it with me. But I'm so glad because that firewall, they, they clamped down it. They didn't even allow Skype at London Business School. I mean, I love them. They were nice and friendly, but oh, come on. You know, IT you know, people just took over and just like security around the, that, you know, the Regent's Park. And so, and so for the, you just squeeze the, you know, the life out of the rest of it. So, um, so, you know, those of us who think internet is life. And so, um, <laughs> there comes the geek out of me. And so, uh, there you have it. And, and then when I got to Dubai, everything was cool in my hotel, but when I got out to the higher colleges of technology, um, you know, even though it, it, it's, it's the higher college of technology, here, come the fire, here comes the firewall again, and, you know, nailed me. And um, so, thank goodness. So, there's something to be said for this, you know, or when you're on an airplane. And we're learning, but I will laugh that, you know, 10 years from now, when I look at this book on a you know, shelf all dusty and so forth, they go, wow, look what was in there, a DVD. <laughs> you, know, it'll look, you know what, it's going to look like a cassette. You know that, right? But, but it's in there. For, uh, and as a matter of fact, we, we, we mirror it up on the website, but there you have it. All right, so, you know, even with that, and I, I'm sorry I've been talking so much, we actually wanted to go through a discussion group and discussion board and show you how we've been using that. We had to build our own discussion board five years ago. Now Google Groups or whoever your favorite uh, group uh, boards are, they're so easy to use that I used it last year in a program called the Mayfield Fellows Program. It's a work-study program to tremendous success. And it was so cool because we didn't have to build any of it. It's, it's all there. It's a service it's called Google Groups. I mean, I'd check it out or come see me sometime. I'll show you how we use it uh, uh, with tremendous benefits. So I just wanted to give you a taste. Now, what is the downside? We should talk about the downside, right? Yeah. So number one. The realities. Yeah, the realities. Come on. Well, I gave you one, right? Just uh, being in the uh, you know, universities in London and Dubai, or it's actually Abu Dhabi, uh, sophisticated universities and, and having all kinds of problems. Audio problems, uh, internet connection problems, firewall problems, so that's still around. Um, and the uh, search and find. I mean, that, this, I, I don't want to make light of this time. It is very, we got a lot of work to do in search and find. You know, we're very proud of this UI, uh, but, but we're a lab. You know, we're really trying to press the, push the envelope, as they say in, in technology circles. It's just, just we need better search technologies yeah. uh, because there's just so much content out there and very little time. This is, does not save any time for instructors or TAs, which is the most precious uh, commodity that they have. Anything else about downsides? It's expensive. Yes, yeah. expensive. It's expensive to develop. In what way? Uh, well, time obviously has, has you know, value to it. But uh, in terms of building this resource, you know, we looked at off-the-shelf products, but they just didn't really kind of meet what we were trying to do. Um, in terms of the equipment, in terms of the processing, in terms of the capture, we hire outside groups that help us with the capture. And I think that's true, even if you're just doing audio and podcasts, there's still a certain amount of kind of hardware device and someone's time that's actually responsible for getting a quality capture. I know I'm not very passionate about this, as you can tell. I'm, I'm not very enthusiastic about this <laughs> set of tools. But, um, uh, okay. So, Students will only, it, it doesn't take away the old adage with any of this technology stuff, and he brought this to my attention yesterday, and I want to share it as one of the wrap-ups. Unless I show that I care about it and it's valuable to me, why should the students care? You know, I mean, it's, and first of all, it'll look disingenuous. It'll look like I'm actually trying to patronize uh, students. Right, students? Yeah, you know, unless I'm in there getting my hands dirty as well and, and being part of that. So it's a, it, that's, but that's no different than anything that's popped up. Well, over and and another way of putting that, I would say, is, is it's not enough to just put a blog up there and tell the students to go use it or post. Yeah. You actually have to spend time in class showing them that it's valuable, showing that you're committed to it, and therefore they need to be committed to it. Well, what's so well. interesting, I wish you'd had time with the discussion boards, because the downside, with it, as much as success we had with it, I didn't spend enough time up there. And, and so, yes, they posted their assignments and things like that, but that kind of reflection part that I was looking for, or general posts, uh, just dropped off like crazy. And I think it's because I wasn't showing that I was up there doing a, some uh, what are track backs and, and, and answering and commenting. So that's something I need to improve on this year. 
uh, if that's going to be successful. Um, so bottom line, it's just like any other technologies. There's you know, challenges in terms of learning curves, maturity of the tools, finding the right fit and uh, uh, an appropriate use. But you know, for those of us who are just looking for ways, and that's, we're, you know, just want to simplify this, we're just looking for ways to have a bigger impact. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, look at the, how broad this is. And this isn't stopping. This is, this is truly a big wave. It is a brand new world. And, and if, you know, I, I look forward, I hope I'm back 10 years from now saying, hey, remember, you know, remember 2007 when we had a chat? Um, gosh, look what's happened, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So I encourage you to, to embrace it, but make sure that uh, support all those media specialists around around campus because we need them as well. It's gonna it's a it's a two person job. Okay, let's do Q and A. Thank you, Robin. Thank you everybody. Thanks for letting me So we'll take your questions until one. Yeah. Over on the back right there, Richard. Can you talk a little bit about copyright and fair use issues when you have video that you capture in your place? Has it ever been misused? Yeah, so the questions about copyright and fair use uh, issues which I've highlighted as one of the big six. You want to talk a little bit about it? Uh, sure. In terms us? of the educator's corner content that we <coughs> capture, use as everyone uses it or signs a release form that makes clear in terms of its use. We also have terms of use on the site describing, you know, kind of fair use and, and where people can use it, where they can't use it. Um, so that's how we've, you know, kind of formally dealt with it on this site. You know, in terms of other classroom use, it's, you know, I, I would refer to kind of general fair use policy in terms of not disseminating unless you have permission. If you can limit it to just the course, you know, it's always the best policy. So far, we're actually not posting other people's content on here either. So it's not true. We're not trying to be the YouTube of entrepreneurship clips, would bring, which would bring on other issues. We, we have had an instance where someone grabbed one of our clips and actually posted it to YouTube, actually of Guy Kawasaki. And someone sent it to Guy Kawasaki, <coughs> and he was actually excited about it and wrote about it on his blog and said, hey, you know, check out this video of me speaking at Stanford. So it's easy to imagine, you know, an, an, you know another uh, instance, but we haven't we haven't really run into that. But we do get a signed release, so legally we're, we're in the clear. Right here. Uh, you promised to <coughs> talk about optimal class size. Oh yeah, that was Can one you of the questions. A word or two about that. Well, well, so, uh, well there is uh, it isn't one. In other words, we're we're actually deploying these kinds of technologies in all three sizes, you know, all three, uh, you know, ten, hundred, thousand, and it's it, it, it's working well. I mean, you know, there's obvious trade-offs, but but I don't know if they're uh, I don't know if they're dependent on the fact of the technology. As a matter of fact, the technology may be helping. I mean, you know, this is you, you face different situations in ten versus hundred versus a thousand. I, I tend to see these technology. Maybe this is more of a general answer, but I tend to see these technologies as kind of a spectrum of options. You know, from really easy to implement and not a lot of work to something that we've totally built and customized. Depending on the class size, there tends to be kind of a matching. You know, I'm not going to set up a whole site like Educator's Corner if it's just for a group of 12 and, and we can't disseminate, disseminate it more broadly. So in part, it depends on kind of where the content is coming from. If we're thinking, you know, you know what, this would be great to just put out there. I mean, it's, it's no more work for us if 50 people view this versus 50,000. Other things like discussion boards or blogs that need to, to have a little more hand-holding and involvement, I'd say we're more appropriate for a smaller class size. What's going to be really interesting to watch is, uh, so you're already watching, it's front page news that's going on between now that Google bought YouTube and then the, the media companies and they're going back and forth speaking of copyright. So we've got that as, but we're just over here thinking we just want to be a source. I mean, we, we wouldn't want a user, that's the source. There's another site like this, this Educator's Corner, it's a terrific one at Cornell University. It's called Eclipse. Get it? Entrepreneur Clips. Eclipse. In this domain of knowledge. So that, uh, and it's kind of cool because we're friendly and we push each other to do even better and build. So what will be interesting to see is will that happen in other domains? Are there other things like this in other domains, well, Robin? That's one thing I was going to add is I think we're increasingly seeing the disciplines take the responsibility and the expense for producing these sources, the digital libraries that you can go to. Right. To get material for teaching. So there are two levels to think about this model. And, and clearly, there was also expense at your level saying, as an instructor, I want to use it. 
but not the same as creating it as a resource. Well, right. So we actually, if you see the bottom right-hand corner here, we, we would not exist, this Educators Corner part of SDVP, without the you know, incredible support of the Kauffman Foundation, which is like the Hewlett Foundation or Sloan Foundation, a uh, significant uh, foundation in Kansas City. Um, and they have been the underwriters of this so far. Um, so, you know, this was a significant expense. I mean, you know, in terms of it, more than seven figures you know, over the years. Eric. Yeah, just think, I mean, it seems to me that, that all these ideas are very exciting in certain domains. I mean, what you're doing in the Technology Ventures Program is getting people to understand a little bit about the culture of technology, and there's no better way to do that with a video clip or hearing someone. But one of the things that's difficult so I think for those of us who are concerned more about conveying engineering practice and the development of skills, that this can be, in fact, diversionary. I mean, people are looking for content when, in fact, what they need to do is practice skills. I mean, I've been able to use some of these things, but I'm worried that you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have lots and lots of entrepreneurs TV and no programmers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all going to come from Bangalore or somewhere, and, yeah. and that that's not going to work. You yeah. know, you can't have that situation. It's unstable. And, and how, do you, how do you propose to use some of these things to encourage people to develop the skills that at least some of our workforce will do? Yeah, well, of course, I showed you a couple of the video clips that were... Uh, appropriate for this setting, you know, sort of inspirational clips. There are process clips. There are process, you know, they're talking about uh, the pro. This is getting into maybe uh, try to make this quick. Um, there, there's an other aspect of teaching entrepreneurs which is very process and mechanical, and so we do have those clips as well. So there's there's you know one or the other, um, but I think. Uh, I think what would be interesting, and I and I, this is what I want to learn, is is who is being successful using video and audio clips uh, for uh, more uh, process oriented uh, learning. You know, whether it's coding, you know, stimulating being a great coder. Because I, I agree, people want to do. You have your own philosophies, I'm sure, about the different the, the fine line between the lecture versus the practice. Um, so we want to let's let's call that something to work on and, and learn together. Because I want that to, frankly, we're not that far apart. I want that to be the same here. We don't want entrepreneurship to be seen as viewed as as, as flashy and, and so on. Is that right? I'm going to see some students. Right? We tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. As a matter of fact, some people say too much of the bad and the ugly. We're actually going the other way. I was just going to say, to tag along, I mean, I, I actually worked at the University of Pennsylvania to put their first courses online in 95 in the engineering school, and we found... Certain courses, it really made sense and went well, but certain courses, absolutely not. You know, and yeah. doing web queuing theory where you're, you know, eight pages of just formulas and having the professor and the specialist trying to key those in. And if you can't have discussion around it, people aren't going to absorb it. And, and so it didn't work. But in certain areas, it, it worked really great. So it really does vary a lot. Yeah, and that's why I tend to go for the clips. And we do podcasts and people want to hear the whole lecture. But I, I use... A, a, a good minute of the clips is quick hits, and then yeah. I get back to saying, "Okay, yeah. now let's get hands on. Let's get you know this. This is a um, entrepreneurship is actually a process that can be learned and broken down into mechanical steps." All right, um, one more, one more. Um, so you mostly talked about transmitting content from teacher to student. Yeah. And I'm interested in <clears throat> how students can also sort of generate their own content. Yeah. I mean, it can be high tech like video or audio, but also just as simple as papers and it seems I mean I don't have a lot of uh, data on this but it seems like that's something that's not all that common that people are required to post to build a website writings. and that sort of thing yeah or even just response papers I mean, that's a start yeah to, to make it either accessible to the all the other students in the class or publicly accessible yeah yeah you know, the two areas that I'm are sure impediments to that I'm sorry are there impediments I'm to doing that do you think um, go ahead um, well, one, one example that came to mind is actually in, in the context of eWeek. Uh, we've, we've got what we refer to as the Innovation Challenge, and that is uh, small team groups who are actually are uh, challenged to create a three-minute video. So they're actually producing a video and then presenting and kind of making their pitch for what they did over the course of the week. So I think the challenge there is that they need to figure out the technologies. You know, some students are really savvy and, uh, you know, others aren't. So they need to seek out the, the kind of group members to, to make that happen. I think there's an interesting um, 
uh, thing that happens in the course when they're actually knowing that they're going to have to post material that the other students are going to see, kind of a peer pressure. On the groups. In the, yeah. in the groups and, and other mechanisms. And, and there have been interesting studies in the way of when do you kind of reveal the post? Do you kind of let them all out at one time? Or is the earliest poster get the most responses? I mean, you know, there's been some interesting work around that um, kind of world. But I, I think that's a really powerful way of getting that kind of peer pressure, peer review um, to actually raise, raise the level of quality. And, and oftentimes, the students will seek out people who know those technologies and they actually you know, use to learn. But obviously, the students coming in these days are more and more savvy in terms of building websites, in terms of using wikis and blogs and videos. Well, listen, um, I know it's 1 o'clock. Uh, I want to thank Robin again. I want to thank Forrest. Will you uh, join me in thanking Forrest for helping me today? <laughs> thank you, Forrest. And thanks for being such a good audience. And uh, I hope this starts a whole dialogue. Stay in touch. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.